Hi, everyone. It is my real joy and pleasure to be with my wonderful friend, Kelly Hunter, again. We've had several conversations. Um, Kelly is, is, is an astrologer I, I hugely respect with all her work. She's a, she's a PhD. She's an internationally known depth astrologer and astromythologist. Um, she's an author, a feature writer, teacher, international speaker. She's particularly focused on uh, the divine feminine. She's written a book about the, the four different Liliths. But she, uh, it was Kelly who in 2020, I heard one of your presentations, Kelly, as you know, and I was just electrified. You were talking about the dwarf planets, the, the Kuiper belt objects, and I was absolutely electrified. And I knew that I had to uh, follow in your path and, and and study them because they really do represent a high level of, of, of consciousness for us, a high octave of consciousness for us. So I always love the discussions we have. And uh, I know you've got a lot to say today bringing in the dwarf planets in terms of where we are now headed. Um, and I think you'd like to start, Kelly, with the, the new moon in Scorpio. Yeah, I think if we focus on the coming new moon, it gives us a, something to look at and kind of see where we're at. You know, we're in that window for sure. And sure. I'm so glad that you got into this too, Pam. It gives me somebody to talk about on, on a level that we can really get into good conversations and we have, you know, insights that we both bring from the research we've been doing. Yeah. Um, I want to bring in uh, a couple that are not as well known or integrated often. Uh, so uh, let me, first of all, and some people may be totally new to this, so I'm just going to back up and give a little bit of a kind of intro um, with that. So do you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is basically the expanding solar system, and it keeps expanding, but this is basically... Uh, the band of the Kuiper belt, which I think of as a far out asteroid belt, you know, because there are these two realms that uh, where there are a lot of objects and a lot of different archetypes kind of activating and uh, inviting us. And this one is of a different order. If we have the, the personal planets, then we have um, the asteroid belt, then we have, as I think of it as like a river with all these rocks in it, and we have to like jump across the river using the rocks, and we get to Jupiter and Saturn, the the uh, social planets, and then we're in the collective consciousness planets. Uh, that would be Uranus and Neptune that are sort of generational, and then Pluto has become, you know, an interface between the collective consciousness planets and the Kuiper belt. So this is kind of just a, a selection of the Kuiper belt objects that I've been working with. Yeah. And um, so I, I consider them a different realm of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I know you do too. And that's what we're kind of figuring out. What, what kind of level is that? If most of these are named for creator gods, um, so here I think of them as quantum, the quantum Kuiper belt sounds really good. And it's also an aspect of um, science that is developing. Yeah. You know, there's more talk about quantum, quantum realm and quantum this and quantum that. And I'm giving here a couple of quotes that I think really express this level. Uh, this is from Deepak Chopra, uh, a well-known um teacher beyond the visible garment of the universe beyond the mirage of molecules the maya of physicality lies an inherently invisible seamless matrix made up of nothingness this invisible nothing silently orchestrates instructs guides governs and compels nature to express itself with infinite creativity, infinite abundance, and unfaltering exactitude into a myriad of designs and patterns and forms. And then David Bohm, who was one of the three um, main people who were developing 
this uh, quantum, you know, mechanics and quantum science, along with Albert Einstein and uh, who was the um, and Max Planck. So he says this is an external presence of consciousness. So. And I love well, David Bohm's work. I, I wrote about him quite a lot in my first book because he he talked a great deal about the implicate order and the explicate order. And the implicate order is 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 really what Plato considered the realm of ideas, you know, what we may think of as 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 plasma or ether, or in this case, you know, quantum consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the explicate order is where we put, as, as humanity, pull it down into events and experiences and reality. Yes, and that's just what I think these Kuiper Belt objects offer, yeah. that pulling it down yeah, uh, and engaging in that level of consciousness more. And it was Niels Bohr also who talked about when we observe something, our thoughts or our theories are you know, impressed on whatever that is and and it reflects it back that the mere act of indirectly even observing the atomic realm changes the outcome of quantum interactions, suggesting the influence of conscious attention and intention on the manifestation of materiality. Absolutely. I, in fact, I quoted Paul Levy in my last update video, and he was saying really exactly that. Exactly. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the act of attention is an act of creation in itself. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so there's also you mentioned ether. So yes. ether in several philosophies, including the Greek, they call it your star body, your ether body. And in. Uh, Hindu Vedic uh, science and also in Buddhist philosophy, they talk about ether as being the fifth element out of which all of the four come. And in Buddhism, they have uh, the physical ether and the non-physical ether. So the ether is where the non-physical can become physical. And uh, certainly if we give it our attention and intention, and so these creator gods and goddesses kind of do that, right? They're envisioning and that vision comes into reality. So this so, is very interesting, Kelly, isn't it? This is going to help us become masters of our mind, I think, oh. with Pluto moving into Aquarius as well, do you think? Oh, that's a beautiful thought. <laughs> and we want beautiful thoughts. <laughs> you know, and, that, and we have to take mastery of our minds, which have gotten way out of whack. You know, we're not educated into the heart or into, you know, different aspects of our intelligence. Yeah. There's been an overemphasis on the mind. Yeah. And that's where meditation comes in or other practices that can help us tame that mind. And, you know, we're we're really finding that we need to be coming more from the heart lately. And there's the other intelligence, which is even lower than that or deeper than that, or another aspect of our the intelligence uh, of our body, the organic wisdom in every cell of our body. Yeah. And then um, partly what I want to talk about today, too, is some Ved old Vedic teachings that I'm I'm tuning into now that talk about the holy womb chakra. That's not one of the seven, but is another aspect of consciousness where our soul spark lives and yeah. it's intimately connected to the heart and men and women both we all have a womb chakra that they, they say carries the the soul spark carries all of our um experience from all our incarnations wow so let's start looking at the new moon with some of these things. Um, and so we're starting with the uh, A Grand Cross from the new moon. And um, one of the exciting things about this and how Maya is not too woven into this at the moment, but that how Maya is now fully into Scorpio is very exciting mm -hmm. and continues you know, her long-term square with Pluto as Pluto is transitioning as well. So um, Haumea is the Hawaiian goddess of childbirth. 
So she is a goddess of the womb. That very, you know, essence that I was just mentioning come up in Vedic teachings. And this is a very powerful place of creativity. And there she is, you know, giving birth um, with a new impetus behind it now that she's in Scorpio. You know, this is an erotic, passionate sign, you know, Eros emerge from chaos with with Gaia Earth. It's the 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 desire to be, and 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 hugely regenerative, isn't she? Not only creative yes. but regenerative, and and that's what's wonderful. And, and in Scorpio, I think of her cleaning up a lot of the toxicity on the planet, and and also, and I I've mentioned this previously, but I think. I think Scorpio is a very important aspect of medicine. That sting in the scorpion's tail is the kind of diagnostic side of medicine. Anything to do with injections, you know, I was very much mm. linking that to regenerative medicine in terms of stem cell treatments and, and, and that kind of thing. Well, I, well, you know, from your own experience. Absolutely. I think she's going to be really, you know, positively powerful in that respect. I think that's going to gallop in the in the period of time that Homer is in Scorpio. It's going to be very mm -hmm. exciting. And of course, Pluto in Aquarius squaring her. There's a lot in Aquarius to do with youth and anti-aging and longevity. That's a very productive square. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were conjunct all through the 50s. So people born in very late 49 into maybe early 1960 have the conjunction of those two yeah. that went on for a good decade. And now they're in a long term square to help us move into this new era. So how may is really you know, one of the, I think, big players and um, uh, very engaging. And um, and here she is in Scorpio now. So that is a, a, a different impulse. Um, and so what else we're looking at here is um, uh, Varuna, which is in Leo. Now, Varuna is an ancient Vedic god. Um, said to be the god of the cosmic waters. Now, I was talking to a woman, uh, Nubia Uttal, who uh, studies these goddesses and does mudras. And um, she said, well, and, and one reason I love Hindu astrology is, uh, or mythology is because with every god, there's a goddess. So she was telling me about Varuni, the feminine aspect of Varuna, which we need to include in the whole meaning of Varuna and how we look at it. And she, uh, Nubia said, this is the goddess of the cosmic water. She brought the water to, to this. So, um, you know, there we go, you know, to our favorite Selassie and, and the other, you know, kind of water energies that, that we've been finding and uh, Varuna and Varuni. Now, Varuna is also um, um, maintains cosmic order and uh, universal law. And uh, we sure need that. <laughs> that's a, so that's coming in through uh, Varuna and Varuni. And it's so interesting, isn't it, Kelly, that so many of these, these dwarf planets have this moral compass you know this 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 part of that archetype is being you you know you must not violate sacred or divine law if we look at orcus too that's saying something very similar isn't yes. it there's, there's a real resonance of we need to come back to right relationship with nature and yes. and, and stop the exploitation and 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 i think you know where we're headed actually has great promise for that mm. Yeah, Varuna actually went on a sabbatical for a while <laughs> when there's a story about um, uh, Varuna. And let me show you a picture. Do I have that picture available? There he is. There's Varuna. Uh, and I, I love, uh, so Vedic God of Waters, Cosmic Order and Divine Law. Now, one of the ways that we can connect to these Kuiper Belt objects is to know where they were when, you know, when we were born. And I always like to say there's a couple of special personal touches that you can connect to it. So partly I've been finding a lot of people who are say like yoga teachers or into um, Vedic philosophy and that includes astrology. Now I haven't, I've just started looking at charts in this way to see how strong Varuna is. 
um, in those charts. And I've been finding that that they are really strong. Varuna is really strong in charts of people who have that interest in that culture and in that, that philosophy. Really? So if you do, you know, or if you're getting a transit, you might become interested in that. Yeah. Which is, you know, part of, of what just happened for me as, as Varuna was partly the catalyst here of my interest in ancient Vedic teachings. Wow. And I'm, I, I have trouble mixing my astrologies, but I am interested in certain aspects of Vedic astrology, particularly the moon mansions where the moon is each night on its 27 to 20, 28, you know, day cycle. And how the moon mansion is is more specifically personal to you, and can be the most important thing in your whole entire chart. It's a whole nother, it's a whole nother uh, roster of of mini signs, you know. Uh, so anyway, um, so Varuna uh, uh, also the day anything is discovered. So if your birthday is on November twenty eighth, which is coming right up, you might have a special connection to Varuna too. Yes, yes, of course. Absolutely. So I'm just inviting people to become interested because it, it's it's a little overwhelming to have this whole bunch of new things on top of the asteroids and the centaurs and everything. So, um, you know, but they're they're offering another, you know, higher invitation in a way that mm, is almost necessary as we enter this new era. And it's so interesting, Kelly, you know, I've been discovering a lot about water myself through the work of um, uh, Veda Austin, went to see her in Glastonbury recently, and uh, Randy Hatton and his wonderful work. But, but Veda is now really starting to see water as God consciousness. Oh, beautiful. We are filled yes. with God because we're made of water. We're liquid crystals yes. filled with yes. God consciousness. And if yes. we become more aware of how we respect water, treat water, send intention and love to water, that will affect every cell of our body. And that's what we're going to beam out as frequency. There's a whole, you know, continuous feedback loop, um, which is something I think very beautiful. And a lot of the water on the earth is as old as four point billion years old. It comes uh -huh. The ice crystals in the interstellar dust, and of course, we've we've still yet to really discover the the primary water that's completely pure underneath the mm. mantle of the Earth, and that you know, there's more of that than in all of the oceans of the world. So, I think we are just really on the edge of finding so much more about water that's actually going to help our consciousness moving forwards as well. Yes, and you know, we're dealing with a lot of polluted water. We really need that's part of our healing process yeah, is sure. is finding water that has salt in it that adds electricity that that is more pure and not filled with fluoride or whatever other chemicals get in there these days. So we we are, you know, a lot of people are are paying attention to the, the water they're drinking and using filters and such like that. So living water, we want the living waters. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so Varuna, yeah, in Leo. So if you're having uh, this transit, you know, pay attention. And there might be some things from um, Hindu philosophy or, or Vedic that could be very useful to you. You might want to have a Vedic reading which gives a different perspective. It's a whole different system. So, um, and you see how active it is during this uh, moon cycle here, it's squaring Jupiter, yeah. which in, in you know, Hindu philosophy, the, they call Jupiter guru because Jupiter is the teacher. Right. And there it is in Taurus. And we are learning from, from the earth and you know we've been so excited for several years now to have uranus in taurus as well um and there's this jupiter so it's the wisdom of the earth and nature and our bodies and our embodiment and uh let me bring attention also to um to uh this is the black moon lilith this is the true black moon. I mean, the way we measure the movement of the black moon is um, 
can be the mean average motion forward through the zodiac. This also happens with the nodes of the moon. And, some and then we can look for the true because it goes retrograde a lot. And so the true black moon can be up to 30 degrees different than the mean black moon. So this is a mathematical point that's connected to the earth moon orbit. So if we go back to talking about the Haumea and her womb energy, the moon is the mother's womb that gives birth to us, gives us our incarnation. And if the black moon, it's not a moon, it's not a body, it's a mathematical point intimately connected to the earth moon orbit. And I've been talking about it and thinking about it as the desire to be. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> especially in Leo. Beautiful. Because yeah. <laughs> just to say, Kelly is quite an expert on, on Lilith, the four Liliths and Hedges. No head. expert, no expert, Pam. <laughs> well, you're ahead of the pack, I think, ahead of the average bear with, with Lilith. Because, you know, there's a lot to it, isn't there? And Kelly's even been teaching me there a lot is, more about there it. There is. And, you know, the, the, these womb teachings have also really started to resonate with the Black Moon for me that it's like the, the cosmic womb, the womb of the divine mother, that is um, the truest, you know, kind of energy of incarnation. Yeah, and yeah. that there are these very deep teachings about the holy womb chakra. And I came across it through the work of Anne Bromley, an, an, who is uh, an English um woman who teaches beautiful, beautiful depth on awakening the sacred womb and the, the quality of that consciousness being in where we sit in a deeper place in ourselves. Yeah. And that that has to do with embodiment. And it is that like connected to the galactic center, the heart of the Milky Way galaxy or the womb of the Milky Way galaxy where all potentials are possible. So we're having this energy uh, squaring Uranus pretty closely on this moon and the black moon, uh, both the mean, which has moved into Virgo basically, and the true were accompanying Venus on her retrograde cycle this summer, which brought that cycle even deeper than usual. You know, if the goddess is going to the underworld and she's calling us into our hearts, especially in Leo, but I think that's what Venus retrograde does anyway, that when the black moon is there, it goes to a deeper place that is down to that soul place, connecting heart and soul. And so that, to me, it, it was a more powerful passage, even than usual. Yes. And we need we need to go that deep. We need to go that deep. But it also reveals like she'll bust our ego. If we're coming from ego, you know, the black moon will totally bust us. And isn't that yeah. interesting in Leo, you know, thinking about the, the ego side? And it's very interesting in that sort of exact square by degree with Uranus, because I also think of black moon Lilith as being a strong symbol for sovereignty as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, Uranus yes. is especially in Leo too, right? Absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and it's a, it, she changes quality. I think when moving into Virgo, but squaring um, from from Leo, there she's really bringing up the activism, the individualism, the rebel, the you know breaking new ground, the you know challenge to the patriarchy, the rules. Well, the I'm not sure. How, I think that's more of an asteroid, Lilith. Okay. Activation. I yeah. to me the black moon. Um, and, and yeah, some people see, uh, the connection between Iris and Black Moon Lilla. Yes. But this is more like the heart and soul connection mm -hmm. that is, is about our spiritual essence, not so much about activism. Right. That's really <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Cause there are other Lilas. There's the asteroid that I think is definitely activist. There's the, uh, potential dark moon that might be another moon that orbits the earth like is it really there is it did it used to be there and now it's not there is it on the astral level like 
you know, and that has a lot of deep esoteric nuances to it. And then there's the star, Algol, the demon, the eye of Medusa that has been called Lilith. So, you know, that's what I write about in my Living Lilith book when they they all started coming to me. It's like, well, how many Liliths are there? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the many faces of the goddess in a certain way. Um, but that that soul connection, that heart and womb connection is feeling very potent to me and goes along with Haumea too. Well, it's so, rebirth energy in a big way. So thinking about new earth, this is very strong rebirth symbolism, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to that deepest place in us that we all don't always tap into, but you know, the soul can go pretty, you know, in our consciousness. If if we can get out of the mind and into the heart, and if we can get like out of the ego and our false sense of self something from our deeper essence that is more sovereign is more uh creative yeah. and uh is our true essence that it's not about your life purpose although it can fuel your life purpose but it's about the essence of who you are yeah. and and how you be and that's especially in Leo, you know, that's like going back to the Chopra quote about the the essence and, and creating and um, um, whatever he said about uh, the different aspects of how nature manifests itself. And in fact, in Vedic, um, in the Vedic teachings, they call the goddess, they call goddess nature. It's like nature is, is that matrix, you know, is that's that's the the essential you know kind of source of creativity and power and what i love uh, is that chariclo is part of that that fixed grand cross because yes. she is just sitting there silently isn't she the eternal buddhist presence the stillness oh. the state of being you know the soul midwife to help this shift in consciousness that we're going through right now and yeah. it also suggests to me that that, that our healing capacity is going to be expanded greatly as we move forwards with Jupiter square to Chariclo, um, also Homer essentially square to Chariclo too. There's a, a great sense of we are going to kind of turn a lot of things around mm. in terms of toxicity and sickness. And, and so I think this has a lot of promise, this fixed grand square as well. Oh, yes. You know, her name has to do with graceful spinner. Yeah. And when I remembered that today, I, I thought of the whirlpools in the water. I thought of structured water, how that happens and and the way the waters, um, you know, hold that that energy that there, there she's the pristine waters, you know, in a kind of way yeah. um, and that she holds space. She's holding space for the best potential to come forward yeah. with a great deal of gentleness and kindness and love and that's a, a beautiful energy um you know i've just become more aware of um the, the well melanie reinhardt has done quite a lot with Characlo and also um uh david leskovitz which who i wasn't aware of before but he's doing quite a lot of work with the centaurs as well and and with this one um especially, you know, he, he's relating it to our personal space, you know, how we hold that, how we define that, how we fill that, you know, and um, our subtle bodies and um, how we, uh, uh, it's about bestowing that um, grace. Grace is a beautiful word for her. It's a beautiful word. And also I love Characlo representing love as a state of being. Oh, yeah. You know, the highest vibration as a state of being, which you continually broadcast to the world. And even mm. if you're passing people on the street or in a shop, your state yeah. of being will ripple out and affect them. And and I, it's just a beautiful archetype, I think. Yeah. And the, the square to Jupiter is so close. Yeah. And so here's part of the potential of this moon and the capacity for transformation is that kindness and, you know, meeting people with a good, you know, hearty hello <laughs> and uh, a big smile. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really, really beautiful. 
you know, how we uh, encounter another person from our personal space to their personal space. And how we can help to shift their energy as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So yeah, this is this is an interesting uh, uh, grand cross to, to talk about because of these different nuances. You know, the Kuiper Belt object. Um, I'm, I'm setting aside Helmea a little bit because she's, you know, she's um, entering, but the other part of it is really, really close and Jupiter. Uh, planet and then Characlo, a centaur object that is about um, different states of consciousness and moving from one of those states to another. Mm. So, yeah, remembering that we're still doing some letting go <laughs> with uh, with uh, that south node Haumea connection still vibrating. And it's interesting as well, Kenny, Kelly, I think it's almost an exact trine from Selassia um, at sort of eight of yes, really. eight of Aries to Varuna too. Yes. Then, oh, that's true. I didn't. I didn't add that one in. So she's yeah. obviously so connected. She's mermaid energy connected to the waters, etc. Mm. It's interesting. Love I her. haven't shared this with anyone yet, and I, I must get round to doing a short video. But after my interview with Veda Austin, she very kindly offered to do me a water crystal. And um, she said, what would you like? And and I wanted to to do something that she may not have any awareness of, because that was such a, you know, she's always trying to find ways to test water that she can't influence. So I said, well, have you heard me talk about Selassia? And she said, no, never. I thought, well, that's a great one. So she just yeah. put the word Selassia on a piece of paper, put it under the Petri dish for, for 30, uh, 30 seconds and then froze the water crystal. And what she got was, um, you know, she has this language of hydroglyphs, uh, water vocabulary. She has to test a water crystal at least 50 times to get the same crystal, essentially. And that becomes her water vocabulary. And she said the two um, forms of the crystal that are really coming forwards are salt and electricity. And she had no idea at all oh. that's the last thing I meant, which of course is salt water maiden and as you know kelly you you can only get electricity where the water has salt in it you yes. can't get it from distilled water and there's one whole theory of life that it began on the seashore with the repeating sort of in and out of the tide that that sort of electrically charged the water to start to form into life and so there's something very fascinating here, oh, about salt, yes. and structured water, and you know, so uh, you know, I could do a whole video on that, but <laughs> I shared that with anyone yet. But it's so interesting; it's coming oh, up. Oh, that is just exactly beautiful. Trying to yes. a, you know, cosmic cosmic waters. So there's something very deep, excusing the pun, in in all of <laughs> this um, this area of water. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because on the new moon, Selassie is at eight eight degrees two minutes of Aries. Right. So she's very tuned in, and then we can add in the the Mercury at in early Sag and and get a grand trine. And um, I have another one for us too. So, um, so I want to make sure everybody got their Varuna sign. Um, looking at that little ephemeris there, and um, yeah, Varuna can um, uses the stars as eyes he, to see what's going on all over the world. The night has a thousand eyes. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So. Um, so here is another, uh, fire triangle, um, wow. using, so we had the one with, um, Selassia, Mercury, and Varuna that you just found. And here we go with another one. And I am excited to introduce, uh, this Kuiper belt object named Promzus, uh, that is in Leo, very close to that true black moon. Right. And so when Venus went retrograde, it was circling with the the black moon. It was circling Promzus. So activating it and bringing out the love. Yeah. So Promzus was, I, I hadn't even heard of it. And I was just getting my list together of all the ones I wanted to research. And I got a uh, the Galactic Astrologer newsletter from Philip Sedgwick, who's who's been tracking 
these Kuiper Belt objects. And he put out, they just named one. And they named it Promsus, that was a Lithuanian god of peace and friendship. So I had to include that. And uh, so Promsus, um, so I was, um, yeah, this is one of my, my Kuiper Belt adventure stories when I was starting to, to work on a sketch for my Planetary Gods and Goddesses coloring book and working with imagery that I found to do with this Lithuanian God that didn't, there wasn't much online. So I had to kind of look more to the culture. And I saw a picture of a beautiful um, uh, uh, field with a fire in the middle and these women in concentric circles kind of dancing around it. And so that got into my, my piece of art about evoking Pramsius. And I was heading down to the Virgin Islands. So I brought my, you know, my Pramsius file with me. And I ended up that the first, second day I was there going to a, uh, a celebration on Peace Hill with a lot of my friends. <laughs> and then there was a full moon circle at this woman's house, whose uh, heritage is Lithuanian. Her great uncle wrote the national anthem from Lithuania. And we were having this fire circle at her house. So yeah, that, so the, there was, it was really reverberating. And it, you know, it, it brought alive that primes just energy. And, and I it, asked her like, hmm? Sorry, go ahead, Kelly, didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, one more little part of that story is, you know, that's a funny word, Pramsius. Like, how do you pronounce it? You know, so I said, how, do you know? And she said, no, but I'll ask my, my cousin. So she emailed her cousin in Lithuania and it's pronounced like prom zus or zus. But, you know, it probably has some special quality in there, but prom zus. So... <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful synchronicity. And isn't it beautiful that it's yes. trying to the North Node, our collective um, path of soul's growth, but also it sort of has echoes of Kwawa as well, doesn't it? Because Kwawa is about coming together in song yes. and dance yes. and joy and connecting yes. spirit mm -hmm. to raise the frequency before you set intention and manifest. So it has some echo, you know, we're back to community, aren't we? And the, yes, you know, definitely the community. community. Community energy, I think, is so strong with, with yes, as well. yes. I this is part of that, and you know, there are like you know, kind of themes that that certain ones like there there are several light bringers. Varda, yeah, Celasia, um, are are light bringers, and there's probably more if I think about it. And um, you know, Varuna. Some of the oldest ceremonies in the world are fire ceremonies. Yeah. And that's very prevalent thing in 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 Vedic, you know, culture or, um, you know, Hindu culture. They do a lot of fire ceremonies. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, promises the Lithuanian God of peace and friendship. And the you know, I didn't find that in any research, but that's what they list on the the small database that of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, under the NASA wing is that they they have, you can look up all the moons of the planets, you can look up all of the small bodies, the asteroids, the, the, um, the centaurs, the Kuiper Belt objects, and get, you know, a lot of information about um, where they were discovered, when, by whom, you know, the name, what that name means. So that's what it said on, on, on that site, you know, is the, the God of peace and friendship. So let's see. Pramsus is the oldest and highest Lithuanian god related to the creation of the world. Wow. He is the god of the sky, peace, and friendship in Lithuanian mythology. So one of the discoverers was Lithuanian and, you know, had the right to name this thing. So there we are. Interesting as well that it's trying to Varda and Varda with her, wife, with her husband Manwe. They were said in the creation myth to create the universe. And Varda was particularly focused on on placing the sun and moon and the stars, wasn't she? She was she was very focused on that. So that you know that's a beautiful trine. I think it's so interesting that these 
these Kuiper Belt objects, which have an orbit of around 300 years apart from Sedna, are coming into such precise geometry at yes. this time to, to reinforce this whole new earth rebirth theme that, that we're really all feeling. That well, that's moving. why they, that's why they're here now, you know, and absolutely. And they, they have these resonances. So yeah. So Barda, she created the light for each new era. Wow. And uh, so we're getting some new light here and as she's aligned with the galactic center at the moment. Yep. And she's um, in a square with Neptune that yep. gives her, you know, that spiritualizes that energy even more and brings out the best side of, of Neptune and its attunement, its frequency, its subtlety. So, um, you know, kind of we're channeling right from the galactic center, you know, when we're tuning into Varda at the moment. Which is creator energy. And we're going to have that that conjunction, Varda, galactic center and the square to Neptune all of next year as well, aren't we as well? Yeah, even as, you know, Neptune's getting ready to change sign, almost does it next summer. It gets up to 2959 Pisces. That's going to be fascinating. The very last <laughs> yeah. minute of the Zodiac. That's going to be absolutely fascinating to see how that manifests. Yes. Yeah. And then it goes into Aries to join Manwe. That's the consort of Varda and was uh, another one of the high archangels in Tolkien's mythology, creation mythology. Yeah. So that that's that's really exciting. Neptune is uh is keeping good company. Um and it also relates to Qua War some because in Tolkien's story, um, which is given in the Silmarillion that was published after he died, um the the creator had a thought, and the thought became a circle of angels. Wow. And they began to sing one by one and then all of them. And then there was this choir of angels and it stimulated that mind of the creator to create a world, a vision, a world. And the 14 got so excited and wanted to go down there and they had to create it. That's like, okay, I guess we have to create that vision. So that they, they're incredible creative energies, you know, with the, with all of the, the Kuiper Belt objects and and no wonder they put this, you know, kind of mythology of Tolkien in there. <laughs> he was certainly a visionary. It's it's beautiful because Neptune conjunct Manway right at the start of the zodiac, you know, the world axis sort of zero degrees of Aries really does suggest a whole new spiritual beginning as well. Yes. It? Yeah, it's another indication that we are really in a whole new era. Yeah. You know, they say we're we're ending the Kali Yuga and going back to uh, the era of light. Yes. And so some of these ancient Vedic teachings are also coming back from the last golden age yeah. and and, you know, kind of helping us heal. That's part of what the holy womb chakra practices and mantras are about. Mantras have and I didn't understand this before they have a frequency. And so they're healing frequencies that come from this like source place that um, that that are being shared. And the there's the the um, the music and the articulation and the rhythm of these mantras. Um, really, it's like tuning forks in our bodies. Beautiful, and that does and speak to sound and frequency becoming a medicine in a bigger way, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just saw a video about a study that um, I guess he's a music teacher and he's interested in science and he figured out a um, how to deliver a frequency that will bust up and dissolve cancer cells. I wrote about that in my first book. His name is uh, Anthony Holland. He was a music teacher at one of the London schools of music and he discovered it was the 11th harmonic that shatters cancer cells yes, right now right. why aren't they using that in hospitals i wonder i just saw something that said that that looked like there was an actual med bed sort of thing you know a kind of a, a kind of i think it's getting more activated now i think that's kind of coming in into one well, certainly time isn't it wow how yeah. that would change the world there's so many new healing technologies using frequencies it's, it's just beautiful to see Mm -hmm. 
well, look how um, you know Varda's squaring Neptune, and you know that 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 music aspect, that vibrational aspect, and Promsis with the Black Moon is squaring the new moon. Yes. So that is, and then we've got Uranus in on it. So that this is another really powerful T square that is, um, you know, probably has another end over there in, in Aquarius. But you know, Saturn's kind of picking up on it. Maybe that's why Saturn went retrograde all the way back to zero Pisces because it wanted to pick up on that way. Yes, <laughs> I just missed. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that is that's profound. That's that's the the awakening that Uranus is creating in a tangible way that we're experiencing more and more. Yeah, that's really true. And um, so this new moon, I'm, I know you talked about this in your new moon video because this is obviously such a strong new moon coming up that's world changing and uh, a bit uh, probably uh, shocking along the way. And we're sit seeing so many literal manifestations you know, with flooding and fires and, you know, all kinds of things going on in the earth energy field. Um, so how is that Scorpio regenerative energy coming forth with Mars there? You know, Mars is a warrior and warriors are uh, protect and defend. They don't always march out to war, <laughs> you know. That's true. It's going to be very interesting. I think the exact opposition, Mars, Uranus, is it the 11th? I, I'm i not keeping up. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I mean, you know, it's it's very, very potent already. So it's going to be uh, it's going yes. to be a powerful month in, in yes. many ways. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the States, November 11th is Veterans Day. Wow. <laughs> so watch this space but it's also Uranus yeah. being the planet of enlightenment that's going to be very energized by Mars I think we could see some wonderful things as well yes and so what what do you think Pam now that you know Saturn is turning forward you know like well we're doing this on November 3rd and that's tomorrow right that's so and it went all the way back to zero yeah. It's like I'm redoing Pisces. <laughs> I'm redoing Pisces. And I think it's a lot about structured water. I think that will be um, a big part of it. I think it's a lot about dissolving 3D linear time and reality. Oh, yeah. oh, I think yeah. it's a lot about that. I think it's a lot about dissolving old traditional structures. And that, of course, reinforces Pluto moving through the last few degrees of Capricorn. I think it's a lot about us developing a stronger spiritual discipline. Yes, yes. And kind of keeping our energy in, a, in like a, a shape, being very aware of our field of energy and how coherent we are maintaining that. I really agree. I think boundaries and integrity, particularly in the spiritual world, uh -huh. I think huge issues right now, huge issues right now that are coming up very strongly for people. So um, it's going to mm. be really interesting. So I think the need to protect one's own frequency and bubble, but nevertheless mm. infecting other people with high frequency energy, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to become much more conscious of all of that and absolutely mm -hmm. living in integrity um because that's that's just such a powerful message i think spiritual integrity of saturn moving through pisces and you know saturn is now on a run through pisces until february 2026 when it enters aries hand in hand with neptune doesn't it at zero of aries and there's manwe yeah yeah Beautiful. yeah manwe was the closest to the mind of god and has those original you know vision original coding that we're supposed to be living under. Yeah. I think it's I, I, be a whole new episode at that point. Oh my gosh. We're yeah. just setting up. Uranus is going to change sign too. I mean, it's, it's going to be so different. It's and, remarkable um, that they're all changing signs, aren't they? There's outer planets, you know, from 20, 23 to 26. Incredible. The energy shift is going to be enormous. Plus the dwarf planets being added in there. I don't mm. think it's been a time in history when we've gone through that. So, uh, yeah, you know, we are the bridge builders right now. We're, yeah. you know, I, I keep thinking of that image in, um, oh, 
what is it where he just builds one more step at a time of the bridge um oh that maverick chap can't remember his name offhand oh yeah. oh the the indiana jones movie? yeah indiana jones and oh okay get across the canyon but he can only build one step of the bridge at a time i think that's what we're doing right now well that's the faith we need with that pisces energy yeah. um so I want to share a couple of images just to give people a, a little more connection. But you know, the fire we we found a double fire triangle in this in this moon, and with the Thanks. north node connected to this one, this is where we're heading, and we need to face forward. You know, we need to to let go of those old stories, and and you know, kind of this is the the um, the trailblazer aspect of Aries that's coming up so strongly, and we're. I'm going to share a couple of images and then we wanted to just take a little peek at the uh, April eclipse next spring. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all need to have that in mind, but I wanted to show you. Uh, so this is Pramzus and you can see where yours is and this little right up here. I always forget where some of mine are and then I'm like, oh my gosh, it's in so-and-so. <laughs> So it, it's a continuing experience, right? It's a it's very experiential, all of this. It's like finding our connection. And then when, you know, our intuition or synchronicity strikes again, and then we're back to re-engaging this energy again. Um, so that's uh that's Primesus. And here is Varda. Oh, she's my favorite. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I probably, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but I've been calling myself Star Lady for a while because when I lived in the Virgin Islands, I was doing stargazing with groups under the tropical night sky and I was Star Lady Kelly. And uh, so then when um when Varda came along, it's conjunct my south node. <laughs> Perfect. So you're meant yeah. to manifest this in this lifetime, Kelly, for sure. I guess so. And I, I really, uh, that Tolkien work is, is just like, wow. So, and, um, you know, I, I really, I, it's helping me tune into, you know, we all have so many aspects of ourselves and, and some of the new ones, some we haven't tapped into want to come forward with this new quantum energy. So I'm tapping back into like, you know, the Elvin era <laughs> in some ways. I think so, that's going to come forward a lot more. That magical fairy ethereal realm, I think is going to come forward a, a lot, a lot more. And, you know, it's beautiful. You're really are embodying Varda with, you know, you're such a visionary, Kelly, <laughs> um, with these Kuiper Belt objects. So, yeah, I think you're really living your mission, your soul mission with this. But I definitely think the whole Elvin fairy ethereal elemental realm is going to become bigger yeah well i think uranus and taurus um suggests that with the elements for sure and then um more of the that might be another outcome of the saturn and pisces energy as I was well just thinking that yeah yeah so so yeah let's look at this astounding total eclipse it's just and and what's fascinating, Kelly, as I <clears throat> mentioned before we started the recording, is <clears throat> if we take Pluto and the South Node out of the picture, I think all of the planets are concentrated within. Is it about twenty degrees in total? Well, thirteen to it's uh, thirteen, so it's like uh, sixty degrees. Yep, that would be a sextile. Yep. And then if we even if we put Pluto back in, it's like 110 degrees. I mean, it's in, incredibly concentrated. So, you know, it is, look at your own birth chart, because if you have planets in Pisces, Aries, Taurus, or even the opposite signs or the other signs that are square to that, you are going to be getting this big time conjunction squares oppositions in a in a major, major way. Yeah. But I mean, this is just a short time before the 20th 21st of april when we have that that very important yes incident. two weeks Jupiter later and conjunction. we're seeing it really close here the jupiter uranus and it's a one-time jupiter uranus it could have been you know include a retrograde and give us three different pings but no we get one and um two weeks after this eclipse 
makes it so yeah. powerful. And, you know, isn't it interesting that Chiron to the minute to is exact the with this solar eclipse? So I think we're going yes. to get a whole new understanding of what that's what that's about. And and in Chiron, as we know, we call it the wounded healer, and it's where you have a wound, and wherever we have a wound, and we've all got it somewhere, we're meant to turn it into, into leadership. And and with regard to that, I just happened to check Gandhi's chart, Mahatma Gandhi. He had his birth Chiron at one degree of Aries on the world axis. Oh. So boy, did he turn that whole imperialist suppression in with India. salt with salt absolutely absolutely uh, you know so beautiful but i think of chiron actually as the true maverick because mm. chiron has a very highly elliptical orbit as as you know kelly and orbiting you know beyond way beyond saturn which is the conventional the rules the regulations the old traditional towards um and beyond i think even slightly beyond uranus and you know i think of him as the maverick in that he won't even identify with the uranus rebel group he said <laughs> you know he's Certainly went <laughs> or the other of the, the other centaurs they're the motorcycle gang you know chiron has a whole different origin absolutely you know he's singular he is a singular maverick and and so that sense of singularity, individuality mm. that's really heightened and the uh, and the healing of the I am, you know, the healing oh. of that sense of I don't matter, I don't exist, you know, I don't have a voice is really get the healing of all mm -hmm. of us going to be heightened at this as this total solar eclipse. I this think. is why we cannot accommodate other people beyond a certain point anymore. We just don't have a lot of wiggle room. We need to be centered in capital S self and very clear, really clear about where we're at. Um, and I, I just, yeah, I just love that exact to the minute. I mean, whoa. And um, uh, oh, I had something I, I was thinking. Well, Selassie is in there too. Yep. Uh, and, but it's, it's uh, anybody say born in 1974 and going to be having a Chiron return. It's like, wow, what a whopper. <laughs> Oh. absolutely massive yeah. and i think you know the word you used earlier of trailblazing i think pioneering i think a deeper more integrated sense of our unique essence than we have ever had in our lifetime we'll yeah. come with it and of course for the u.s this is smack across the u.s from what northeast to southwest crossing the i'm in the zone here in vermont i'm in the zone i might oh, not be wow. there but yeah. Now, in in um, in Vedic philosophy, you know, there there's the old saying, "Don't go out and be go under an eclipse," sort of thing. So their their take on that is the moon is a really positive energy. The sun is a really positive energy. So you don't have a negative and positive polarity. You have positive positive, and it's like almost too much to handle. Oh, that's so. So it's just too much energy. So, you know, you're asking for it if, if you're out watching the eclipses. But people will be for sure. That they will be for massive. sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so Kelly, yeah, we're sort of coming up to the hour now. Is there anything else you would like to say about, about this total solar eclipse or anything else that you've you've shared today? It's been so rich. Ah, uh, yes. Um, Oh. So, oh, here's what. So, um, you know, we had this really especially intense Venus retrograde. And right around when Venus went retrograde in late July, so did Chiron at 19 degrees. So we've already, and we had that Jupiter and Uranus getting as close as they were going to get. And then Jupiter went retrograde. So it's as if we were already tapping into this energy yeah so and this is the four this is yeah trailblazing like the star trek motto to go where no one has gone before <laughs> and we will i we absolutely i think there's no doubt we, we will. absolutely we, we're we you know we're yeah. we're in the tsunami of of a love revolution right now and and i think that's what this is about um, yeah and and the whole collaborative aspect of it with um by then you know, there's a Pluto in a, in Aquarius. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so and squaring, you know, squaring so much of this, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be exquisite. He's he's actually what in a sextile to Venus. Oh, that's, that's a beauty, beautiful. isn't it? Yeah. You know, so again, the love revolution. There we have it astrologically. Yeah, it's so Venus is so strong. And I believe that I, I heard this. I, I need to, you know, <laughs> review the sources, but because of these these waves, galactic waves of light coming in through our whole solar system, all of the planets yeah. are exhibiting changes. And I, I've heard that Venus has gotten brighter. Oh, wow. and, and so, so I don't know if that's really true, but I like to think it is. I mean, I makes sense to me. <laughs> wow, because I was talking only yesterday to Nancy Rebecca about these galactic waves of, of light coming in this month, November. So, you know, boy, is this... <laughs> is this an exciting time to be to be alive it's a very wow. challenging time with all that's going on in the world but it is making us masters of our frequency it is and making this is where the the positive warrior the spiritual warrior energy comes up and we can transform the 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 violent militant type to that other kind of spiritual warrior that that has honor and moral integrity and um, stands for what is a true and right and love. So there, that courage that it takes. Absolutely. To, you know, this is why we're here to forward. Mm -hmm. change the repeating pattern of the hamster wheel. We've got to get beyond the hamster wheel, being you know, pioneers, trailblazers, light warriors and love warriors. And isn't that the basic choice that we've been confronting? Are we going to shrink in fear or are we going to expand in love? Couldn't be clearer because whatever you focus on expands. Yes. And that's it. What is that intention? Clarify your intention. And I, I hadn't also gotten quite clear on that, you know, in the, in the mantra practice I'm doing. Um, there's healing potential, but you need to be in cl clear about your intention. Yes. Yeah. Intention is so important. We're going to live much more intentionally going yeah. forward because we're really going to get this, this mastery of our thinking and our emotions. Yeah. And there's that Saturn in Pisces, like, don't be all wishy-washy, you know, don't be leaky, you know, Absolutely. Like, you, yeah. know? Be a, you know, be an avatar almost. Um <laughs> Beautiful, yes. Kelly. The sharings are always so rich and you do so much, you know, phenomenal research and really dig deep to find new information for us to enrich our world. So I'm always so, so grateful to you. It's been it's been wonderful. And I hope everybody out there enjoys this as much as certainly I have. And and I just want to oh, thank well, you. Well, you know, it's not the cup of tea for everybody, but, you know, please at least take a sip of one or another of the Kuiper Belt objects and 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 see where that takes you. Yeah, it's a journey. It really is a journey, but you are an unstoppable researcher, <laughs> Kelly. Um, so, you know, thank you for all that you're, you're doing for the world, so. And uh, you too, Pam. <laughs> so God bless. So bye everyone. Um, hope you've loved this as much as I have and bye for now. <laughs>